I have been crucified with Christ. We say it so glibly. But, you know, crucifixion is death sentence. Amen? When you went to the cross, you died of the effects of the cross or they killed you at the end of the day. There was no two ways about it. You're dead. So when Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ, that is stark reality. And he wants you to be clear about it. It is no longer I who live. I'm dead. But, and that's a good but. Amen? That's a good but. But Christ lives where? In me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, and a lot of translations you will find say, in the faith of the Son of God. But I think it's more correct, like the King James says, I live by the faith. Because who's living? Me or him? I live by the faith of the Son of God. Now let me ask you this. Is that enough faith to meet every circumstance of your life? I thought I would get more amens than that. Is that faith good enough? Amen. I live by the faith of the Son of Love, uh, Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the gospel right there. The whole deal right there. If you don't learn anything else in your life for this morning, learn this. I've been crucified. I'm dead. Dead to sin. Dead to myself. My desires. It's no longer I who live. I'm dead. I'm dead. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me. He did what? He loved me. Do you feel that love? Do you feel that love this morning? That God loves you. And by the way, he loves everybody. I could get to preaching now. If God loves everybody, and he loves me, and he loves in me, and through me, shouldn't I love everybody too? Now I know there are some people that are hard to love. Some people are even Christians. Some Christians are hard to love. Just write down, well, I call them porcupine Christians. You know, those kind of people that have so many good points that they get hard to get close to? I'll let you figure that one out. <laughs> By the way, you can pet a porcupine. They make they make good pets, I understand. But you don't want to go the you don't want to rub them the wrong way. <laughs> 
I live in the flesh the life of what? I'm kind of mixing the words around here. I, I live the, now in the flesh the life of Christ. Amen? Because Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Is that easy to do? It's not. Perhaps you feel like Carl. Let me, let me share a little bit about Carl. Frustration was written across the, Carl's face. He told his pastor, I just can't get it all together. I read the Bible every day. I've helped several of my friends come to know Christ. And I don't have any gross faults, but something isn't right. No matter how hard I try, I'm never satisfied. I feel I haven't done enough and I just don't have the joy I used to feel. Maybe you felt that way. A psychologist would quickly recognize Carl's tendency toward perfectionism and his need for constant activity to feel worthwhile. He would probably give him some psychological label like neurotic and start helping him to understand how childhood experiences programmed him for his frustrating lifestyle. The psychologist would probably be correct since an insatiable need to perform and a general lack of personal fulfillment both have their roots in early childhood. But this is only the psychological side of Carl's problem. You see, there is also a theological side. In adulthood, these same attitudes are transferred onto God so that Carl always feels a little dissatisfaction in his Christian life. In fact, if the Apostle Paul had talked with Carl, he might have said, Carl, you're feeling the same frustration so many feel today. You feel you have to do something to please God. But let me tell you something. No matter how hard you work or what you do, you'll never feel you've done enough. You're trying to relate to God by living... Okay, now we're going to get on the Sabbath school lesson. Under the law. We're living under the law. But, you see, you don't understand the difference between law and grace. And Paul would be putting his finger on one of the central issues in the Christian life. All that we've said so far about freedom from guilt is built on a proper understanding of God's grace. Amen? Don't we understand? Okay. I don't know, just, I don't know if anybody's following me or not, you know? <laughs> Guilt, its only lasting solution is found in the grace of God. To firmly cement in our minds the foundations for guilt-free living, we will look at the biblical teachings of law and grace. This is a fundamental to overcoming guilt and building a positive self-image. First question is, how do we become acceptable to God? How do we get daily blessings from God? How does God motivate us? And fourth, where do we get the power to live as God wants us to? Now, we're not going to just always identify all these questions as we go, but uh, we will be covering these points. Well, the most basic uh, difference between law and grace is how to get God's acceptance. Now, the law says that uh, we must perform to be accepted. 
That's what the law says. You must be perfect. Grace says you are accepted, now you can perform. Thank you for the amen. You are accepted, now you can perform. The law lists numerous specific requirements we must meet to merit either eternal salvation or a daily fellowship with God. Under grace, we are accepted first because Christ died for us and then we naturally tend to perform as God wants. We perform not to earn acceptance but because we are accepted. That's good news. Amen? Amen. The law says, get to work. Grace says, it is finished. Uh, let's use a text to illustrate this. Paul says, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Now you read the first part of this text and you say, oh, I got to be kind to everybody. Oh, that's so hard. Joe over there, oh man, I don't, I don't like the way he, he acts sometimes. You know, how am I going to be kind to Joe? Where's the grace in all of that? Well, let me highlight grace. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. How? Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. That's grace, you see. We can we could try to muster up all of the backbone we have in order to try to be kind to a nasty person. And that's that's an impossible task most of the time. Tender hearted, forgiving each other. But when you do it just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And now, where's Christ? Christ is living in you. And in me. Good news. Well, let's see what uh, the Old Testament has to say about it. Isaiah 64 verse 6, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment, and all of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Well, we can relate to uh, this uh, time of the year with this text, amen? We, we see the withering leaves and the blowing of the wind taking them away. All our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. Well, we can't even really tell you what that means. And, uh, but if you want to look in the, in the commentaries, you'll find out. Uh, filthy garments, the worst kinds of things that you could even think about. That's our best is like that. So what hope do we have? Well, I, I think Isaiah, I'm glad, revealed to us the good news of the gospel. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. Why? Because or for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. My garments were what? Filthy rags. But he has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels. 
What a beautiful, beautiful text this is. Amen? I, you know, I went probably 25 years of my life or more before I discovered this text. But I heard our righteousness is like filthy rags over and over and over and over again. I don't think that we should say one without this other text. Amen? We got to have the, the garments of salvation, the robes of righteousness. And how do we get those? Well, remember we talked uh, about the, the book of life. You do remember that, right? Okay, some of you do. The book of life. If our names are written there, those are the people that get to enter into the, the new Jerusalem, right? That's what Revelation 21 verse 27 says. If your names are written there, you get to go in. And I hope all of our names are written there. Because that's, that's the most important book. As I think about the judgment scene, you know, we, we come before God's judgment throne. We stand there. Now, I don't know about you, but I've done plenty of things that I need to hang my head in shame over. And if Paul's evaluation of us in, in Romans 6.23 is correct, we've all sinned, or Romans 3.23, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is what? Death. That's what we've done. That's what we deserve. The law loudly tells us our sins. Right? That's what its, that's what its function is. To point out that we are sinners. But I am so glad that we have illustrations in the Bible. Amen? Amen. Uh, one of the hardest illustrations you'll ever ever find in the Bible is the story of, of Abraham and the requirement God told him to go and take his son, his only son, Isaac, the son of the promise. Take him up on Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice. And sometimes God asks us to do things that we do not understand. I do not understand how he could ask the prof, some of the prophets to go around naked for several years at a time. He did. That's, he, you know, he was trying to get people's attention, I guess. I guess that would do it, wouldn't it? see the preacher come in naked I mean that would just probably well I don't know what they did back then but but that's what God asked him to do and God asked Abraham to take his son the son that he had waited all his life for he was a hundred years old when his son was born And now about 15, 17 years later, Isaac's a young teenager. And God says, take your son, your only son Isaac. Take him up to Mount Moriah and offer them there as a sacrifice. First of all, Abraham would have had to really know the voice of the Lord. Amen? I mean, you just don't want to follow any crazy voice that might be speaking in your head. You've got to know that that's God's voice. 
That means that you've got to have a good relationship with God up until that point. <laughs> Can you imagine as Isaac and Abraham start up the mountain, they've left the servants down with the, with the donkeys. As they start going up, Isaac turns to his dad and he says, Dad, he says, here's the firewood. Here's the fire in the censer. The knife is here. Uh, but where's the lamb for the sacrifice? I imagine that was the most difficult question <laughs> Abraham ever had to answer that his son asked. But inspiration came upon Abraham and he said, the Lord will provide himself a sacrifice. When they get to the top of the mountain and the altar is built, there on that spot which later would become the, the altar of burnt offering in the tabernacle, Abraham has to explain to Isaac that God has asked him to do this most difficult thing. You know, if Isaac had not been a believer in God, he could have run like crazy. And his dad, being almost 120 years old now, 117, something like that, would have been hard put to keep up with him. But the faith of Isaac is as strong as Abraham's. Because when you read in the Bible, it's the, the, the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a, there's a lineage of faith. And so important in our families that we recognize and are responsible for training up our children in the way that they should go. And, and Isaac was trained up in the way of the Lord. And he submitted. He submitted. And Abraham tied his hands and put him on the, the bundle of wood. And raised the knife. And as the knife is coming down, the angel of the Lord, and by the way, if, if you do a careful study of, of that terminology, you'll know that this is Jesus himself in form of Michael, Mikael, the one who is like God, God's own son. He caught his his arm and he says don't kill your son now I know now I know now that you are willing to do even this deed basically if you want to know the uh, the underlying test that Abraham was going through is do you love me as much as the heathen loved their God the heathen were sacrificing their children to Moloch in the in this arms of this bronze idol that uh, was heated internally to red hot status, and they would place their little babies on these iron molten red 
arms that were full of fire inside and and they would instantly kill their children. I can't imagine why, how the devil has gotten this kind of thing going in, in the world back then and things that go on today. It's just, just incomprehensible. But as they looked, they saw a ram that was caught in the thicket and they brought that as a substitute and offered it on the sacrifice. And that's, that's the way it's always been. From the beginning in the garden when Adam and Eve first sinned, the, the skins that made the garments to cover their nakedness that was caused by sin were a prefigurement of the robes of righteousness which we get as a result of Christ's death in our place and his perfect righteous life. That's the, the whole process that is being proclaimed and it was proclaimed throughout every uh, sacrifice in the uh, this earthly sanctuary and, and tabernacle and temple throughout the years. The innocent lamb providing the blood sacrifice that brought the cleansing of sin. And Jesus, when he stands before the Father and, and our, represents us as our attorney, he says, Father, you know that we love this child of ours. I lived in his or her place. I died for them the death that they deserve. They've accepted me. And I give them my righteousness. If you want to look at the text in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, by the way, notice it doesn't say sins, it says sin. He knew no sin. He made him to become sin. To be sin. That is all the ugliness of Satan's rebellion and our rebellion. He made him to become all of that. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's good news. Amen. That's the free gift that God gives to us that cost him everything. When Jesus was on the cross, he was sin. This is a text that, that I had a hard time understanding for many, many years. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. I used to think, Lord, God, why, why would Jesus use the serpent to represent himself? And when you think about what Paul wrote there in 2 Corinthians 5.21, it makes perfect sense, amen? Because God made him to be the serpent. He made him to be the devil's everything. All that, all that the devil and all of his crowds were. That is what Jesus was on the cross. And it was so horrible that swirling around Jesus was, and his cross was a blackness that was so deep Jesus could not see out. 
He could not see the Father's face. He could not feel the Father's love. He was cut off from human beings and His divine Father. This was a, a most horrible experience. Much more horrible than I can even portray it. But as Jesus dies alone... He does not know if he's entered into an abyss so deep and dark, a black hole that is so horrible that he cannot get out of. That's why on, on the first day of the week, when Gabriel called Jesus and said, Your father wants you, that was good news. <laughs> Your father's calling you. And, and, and he's coming out of the tomb. And there, there is his friend Mary. Crying her eyes out. Because she's lost her dearest friend. Her savior. The one who saved her from certain death there in the temple. If he had not written those words in the sand... She would have been dead and gone. She knew what it was like to be saved. She knew what it was like to come and out of a heart of love do the things that needed to be done. To wash his feet with perfume that proclaimed that he was loved and cared for and and there she was to, to finish the work there on that Sunday morning. And, and there the tomb was empty and she was, didn't know where he was. That Jesus that was so loving to her. She mistook him for, through, his te through her tears, she mistook him for the gardener. And she says, sir, if you will just tell me where you've taken me, I'll, I'll take care of him. I love him. And then he spoke that word. Made all difference in the world. Mary. You know, there's a, there's a thing that says, there's a, there's a phrase that says, there's no sweeter sound than our name, you know. I have often kidded the family that if I had a son, I would have called him Isaiah's kid's name. You, you know, it's it's just about the longest name in the Bible. Meher Shalahashbash. Ah, oh, it just rolls off your tongue with such ease. Call him Bash for short. <laughs> My wife tells me I'm not allowed to use that around him. <laughs> they call him Maverick. I says, yep. That's it. Meher Shalla Hashbash. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> Different language. The prey haste, the speed spoils. That's a maverick, right? <laughs> Mary. And instantly she knows that voice. And she grabs his feet. And and she's just so full of joy and love and Jesus says you know don't detain me I don't like don't touch me because that doesn't get the idea of what's going on here Jesus is, is on a mission to go back and see dad and his heavenly father and know and find out if it all worked And so he says, go and tell the disciples I'll meet them in Galilee, but I've got to go see Dad. Don't detain me. He's on a mission.
as we think about that great love that God had for us. It was only the righteous life of Jesus that was able to make us righteous. Amen? It's not us. God made him to be sin for us. So he took my sin, he took the sin of the whole world, the whole sin problem to the cross. We receive his righteousness so that we might be the righteousness of God. It's not our righteousness, it's the righteousness of God. That's the good news, friends. That's the good news. I hope you can, hope you can see that. That's, I think, good news. And when we get the robe of Christ righteousness, He takes care of our sin problem. Amen? He washes us clean. That's what baptism is all about. Amen? I've been, I've been crucified with Christ. I've gone down. I washed clean. And I've been given the righteousness of Jesus. The righteousness of God. That's good news. That's gospel. Notice this, what Ellen White says about it. The robe woven in the loom of heaven has in it not one thread of human devising. Not one thread. It doesn't have any contribution from you and me. That's good news. This robe has not one thread of human devising. Christ in his humanity wrought out a perfect character and this character he offers to impart to us all our righteousnesses, our filthy rags, Isaiah 64 verse 6. Everything that we are of ourselves can do is defiled by sin. So if we try to help God out with our righteousness, we're we're sin, right? We're defiled by sin. But the Son of God was manifested to take away our sins. And in Him is no sin. Sin is defined to be the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 5 and verse 4. But Christ was obedient to every requirement of the law. He said of Himself, I delight to do Thy will, O God, O my God. Yea, thy law is written upon my heart, within my heart. Psalms 40 verse 8. When on earth, he said to his disciples, I have kept my father's commandments. John 15 10. By his perfect obedience, he has made it possible for every human being to obey God's commandments. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with His heart. The will is merged in His will. The mind becomes become to us one with His mind. The thoughts are brought into captivity to Him and we, li we live His life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of His righteousness. Then as the Lord looks upon us, he sees not the fig leaf garment, not the nakedness and deformity of sin, but his own robe of righteousness. That's good news, amen? His own robe of righteousness, which is perfect obedience to the law of Jehovah. Is your name written there? Are you dead yet? Are you dead yet? I have been crucified. And by the way, Paul says that's an everyday experience. Every day, every moment, we got to keep on the cross, reminding ourselves where it came from, so that we are there. Well, I, I see I've gone over. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, 
let me okay I'll get down here how do we get the power to live the life it's again the life of the Son of God who lives by faith in me amen, amen. that's how we get it We need to go to the cross every moment of every day. And as we do that, we realize it is we, it is me that put Jesus there. But you know what? As God looks down, He doesn't see that old self, but He sees the new self. Amen? You see it there on the ground? You can, if you look down, you can see his reflection is new. It's a new person. And Jesus invites us to come home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. The way of the cross leads home. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your great love. Oh, for a thousand tongues to tell. Oh, for a billion years, we still wouldn't be able to plumb the depth of, depth of your great love. But Lord, we're thanking you right now for your gift of salvation so rich and so free. Oh Lord, we come not because we're worthy, but because we're needy. And Lord, we just are so thankful that this good news is available for us still today and for our world. We need to tell, we need to go and tell that Jesus lives and he lives in me and he wants to live in every other person that we come in contact with. Lord, may your grace, your amazing grace, Touch each one of our hearts today and call us home. Call us to accept the only plan that you've ever had. That you would be our God, we'd be your people, and you would live in our midst. Lord, help us to be like Jesus. Help us to be like Jesus every day. This is our song. This is our prayer. This is our desire. In his beautiful name we pray and give you all the thanks, the honor, and the glory now and forevermore. Amen.